You May Nikki, or Dream Diary in English, is an indie exploration game released in 2004 from the developer Kikiyama, where the player can enter a dream world and go through doors leading to various unique locations. We play as a girl called Marutsuki, whose name translates to window or a window. The main point of the game is to explore all the different areas, collecting effects. These effects change Marutsuki's appearance and also sometimes grant special abilities. You start off in Marutsuki's room, with only access to the balcony from there. You cannot leave otherwise. Once you go to bed, you wake up on the balcony and can go back into your dream room, a nearly exact replica of the original. You can also now leave through the door on the top left, where you'll find what is known as the Nexus. The Nexus contains the 12 main doors that the player can explore throughout the game. Besides that, there are multiple additional sub-areas that cannot be accessed directly through the Nexus, but rather have to be found while exploring the main ones. Each area is usually a large, mostly empty looping map with a few points of interest. They can be colorful, dreary, somewhat creepy. I don't necessarily think the game is supposed to be a typical horror game, but I do think it intentionally tries to make you uncomfortable. The ending of the game appears to be very dark, with Marutsuki jumping off her balcony, falling to the ground below, only leaving a pool of blood. She accomplishes this by using a small staircase that leads off the ledge, an event that takes place after you collect all of the effects. But like many other fans theorize, I think the reality portion of the game, that being Marutsuki's real room and balcony, are also just a dream. I believe the entirety of Yume Nikki takes place within Marutsuki's mind as she grapples with the idea that she no longer exists. That is to say, the end of the game isn't when she dies, it's just the moment where she finally has accepted what she's subconsciously known from the beginning. I think the dream that you explore is supposed to represent fragments of memories and feelings. It's Marutsuki's brain attempting to reconcile with its demise, leading her deeper and deeper into a dreamlike state where she has to face the isolation of an inevitable eternal sleep. The creator, Kikiyama, once said in a written interview that Yume Nikki is not supposed to be a horror game. It's meant to be warm-hearted. That's why I don't believe the ending is exactly what it seems. Yume Nikki is about coming to terms with your own death and accepting it as it is. It may be isolating, but it's also calm, serene, and not something to be afraid of. Supporting my theory, the game is littered with examples of death. Suicide, hospice, drowning, car accidents. Many fans attribute the different examples of death shown throughout Yume Nikki to Marutsuki herself. Popular theories being that she was killed in a traffic accident or committed suicide. Looking into Marutsuki's inner consciousness is also looking at our own. More than a character, I think she's supposed to just be a human and we can relate to her on that level. The idea of Yume Nikki is to give us the ability to confront all of the terrors we have, of death or otherwise, presented in abstract ways and aided by the comfort of this little girl as our guide. As mentioned before, I believe that the entire game takes place in a dream. The point of the game is repeatedly going deeper and deeper within Marutsuki's mind before eventually waking her up to save. I think the waking up mechanic is just a red herring, and as I stated before, Marutsuki is actually unconscious the entire time. The intentional choice by the developer to nearly always show Marutsuki's eyes closed even when she's supposedly awake is something that supports the idea that the entire game does not take place within reality. Also, within Yume Nikki, there are multiple beds that look exactly like Marutsuki's bed in her room, and when slept in while in the dream world, can transport you to a new location. While trying to get the ending in my playthrough, there are multiple points where I had to repeatedly sleep, wake up, sleep, wake up and I started getting confused as to if Marutsuki was supposed to be awake or not. The dream world bedroom and the real bedroom are nearly identical with only a few minor details being off. Additionally, during the ending of the game, after Marutsuki dies, two jellyfish appear, the same jellyfish that are found within the dream world. I have no doubts that when Marutsuki appears to jump off, she is actually already deceased or unconscious at the very least. There is a black cat you encounter on the rooftop of an area commonly referred to as the mall. Not only does the appearance of a black cat oftentimes symbolize death, 
but because of the superstition black cats were killed in mass, a cycle of fear and cruelty that fed into itself. So not only could this black cat represent the fact that death is an inevitable fact of life, but also that it is part of Marutsuki, the girl who's already gone, her life being just as unsalvageable as the reputation of the black cat. Now, what does this mean for my overall theory? I think the point at which Marutsuki dies in the ending is supposed to represent Marutsuki, and in turn, the player finally moving on and accepting death. The implication of a super rather than a different method is showing that Marutsuki has made a decision herself, and after exploring every area that can be accessed through the Nexus, areas that I interpret as fragments of memories, emotions, ego death, only then, after accepting all of herself and life, is she finally able to move on. I don't believe the intent was to focus on how Marutsuki died, but to focus on accepting it as something so inherent to being human and something that cannot be reversed. I mentioned the term ego death in relation to what kind of things your mind goes through while dying, and I want to expand on that thought a little further. It's a term commonly used to describe what happens to you after using powerful drugs, and it is defined as the complete loss of subjective self-identity. Basically, you see yourself as you are, rather than what you think you should be. Obviously, it's more terrifying and complicated than that as your mind is surrendered to an overwhelmingly heavy feeling of loss and helplessness being forced upon you that you cannot bring yourself back from until the drugs wear off. This feeling is honestly what I imagine accepting your own death has to be like. Letting go, surrendering. Not out of fear, but just out of acceptance. It has often been thought that when we die, our brains release chemicals to produce vivid hallucinations and feelings of joy and happiness, perhaps as a sedative. Although the studies on humans are inconclusive, when studying rats, scientists have concluded that trace amounts of DMT were released upon death. Whether or not we actually experience psychedelic hallucinations when we die, I can't help but connect that idea to the various imagery we see in Yume Nikki. The graffiti world, number world, neon world, the rave monkey event, face, all of these bring forth imagery of what many describe and illustrate hallucinatory drugs to be like. You see so many colors melding together, flashing, twisting, as you drift off into nothingness. But it's okay. Everything is still okay. There's an event in Yume Nikki that I think illustrates this idea very well, when Marutsuki acquires the scarf and hat effect. When you gain this effect and press 1 while you have it on, Marutsuki can turn into a snowman. If you happen to sleep in the bed as a snowman, there's a random chance it'll transport you to a staircase that leads down into a hallway with burning fire. If you stand close to the fire as the snowman, you'll begin to melt and soon be unable to move. The idea of a melting snowman next to a burning fire is as irreversible as it gets. Ice changing to water, changing to water vapor, going back into the atmosphere. I think that this moment in the game is meant to show the beauty in fleeting life and how the fact that it is meant to and will end makes it more precious. I also want to touch upon one of the most famous scenes in the game, due to how strangely terrifying it is. The scene I'm talking about, of course, is in the house on the pink sea where you can find Poniko's room. It's a cute room with cute decorations, and inside is a girl with a blonde ponytail and aloof expression. You can't interact with her or change anything. The only thing you can really do is turn her light off. When you do this, there's a 1 in 64 chance that Poniko will transform into the terrifying Uboa, a strange, creepy, melting, half-black and white disfigured face that will shake the screen and play menacing music and make it impossible to leave the room. Interacting with Uboa will send you into Oboa's trap, an endlessly looping room that is impossible to escape from without waking Marutsuki up. The correlation between Poniko and Uboa has always confused fans of the game, leading them to theorize about Poniko's true intentions with the player. Is Uboa her true form? And the little girl with the ponytail is just a front to hide some kind of demon? Or is Uboa a split personality that takes over Poniko? I personally don't think the explanation has anything to do with the personal lore of the character of Poniko, but instead with Marutsuki's psyche. If you consider Poniko and herself, and House, to be a part of Marutsuki's subconscious, perhaps it represents what Marutsuki wished her life could have been like. A perfect room, with perfect decorations, a girl she perceives as being what she wants to be. I interpret switching Poniko's light off as a sign of discontent from Marutsuki, 
that she's turning it off as an act of defiance to this perfectness she could never attain, rather than embracing the life she led herself. I believe this is what causes Uboa to form, trapping Marutsuki in an endless cycle of self-hatred and stunning her ability to accept her life, and in turn, her death. It would be impossible to go through every single area in Yume Nikki and give a thorough analysis of each one, and even if I did, the evidence I had for what each place represented would be clumsy at worst and a reach at best. In general, I think the dream world areas are supposed to be a messy amalgamation of the human psyche, some of them giving you a sense of childlike wonder and nostalgia, and others being dark and creepy nightmarish mazes that loop endlessly. But traveling through all of them, you get to see a bigger picture, like a person. Like you. The one common theme throughout each area is this lingering feeling of being truly alone, isolated. You come across various NPCs, however, pretty much all of them are far from human, and you cannot speak or meaningfully interact with any of them. There's an event in Yume Nikki where you crash land on Mars, and while accompanied by a strange humanoid figure, Marutsuki is still essentially alone. You can leave the spaceship and walk around Mars, and the only way to escape is to wake up. Being crash-landed on another planet is as isolated as you can get, and yet there's a beauty in that solitude. This feeling of true isolation is something that we all have to reconcile with, that after death, we will have to face a plunge into the unknown all by ourselves. It sounds grim, but I think Yume Nikki is trying to show that the isolation in and of itself is in some way a comfort, that you can find peace within yourself as you wander around aimlessly, surrounded by warm darkness. Beauty, beauty.